seated. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. My name is Mike. I want to welcome you guys to Impact Church. And uh, we are excited to have you with us this morning. An awesome opportunity to meet with the Lord. And uh, I just want to thank you guys so much for giving not only us, but the Lord your time this morning. Because if you, get, if you come prepared, if you come ready to meet with God, then he is going to do something in your life. But every, even before I came up here this, right then, I was just praying, God, take away anything, anything at all that's going to keep me from meeting with you right now. Anything at all. And I hope that you guys said that prayer as well. I hope you decided that you wanted to meet with God. That today isn't just a routine situation for you, going through the steps, making it a habit. I want this to be something that you're excited about. So go ahead and grab your Bibles, turn to Psalms, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 2. We're going through our current teaching series, Pressure Points. And uh, when you think about pressure points, when you look at pressure points, you know, you understand what it is that uh, needs to change in your life, right? When you feel a a pressure point on your body, when it gets pressed, when it gets uh, compressed, all of a sudden you start feeling this pain in your life, right? You start feeling this pain in your body, And what's happening is as that pressure is being applied to that point in your body, your body is then telling the brain, listen, something's wrong. Something needs to change. Something isn't going in the direction that it needs to be going in. And it's your body telling you, you need to make a change. Well, the author of Psalms had that same intention. Actually, the author, there was multiple authors of the book of Psalms Specifically, we're going to be looking at a psalm from David this morning. But when you look at that and when you understand that when that point gets pressed, when God's pushing at that point in your life and he's saying, hey, Mike, I want you to see this. I want you to feel this. I want you to change this, to react to that pressure point in your life. It's been an awesome study so far. And uh, if this is your first time, I want to encourage you to stick it out with us for the rest of this series. We got today and we got two more weeks after this before we go into our next series. But I want to challenge you to stick out this series with us called Pressure Points. Um, You know, these this is an awesome opportunity for us to understand who is our leader. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So last week we looked at what direction are you walking in Psalm chapter one. Today we're looking at who is your leader in Psalm chapter two. So go ahead and get your Bibles. The book of Psalms, you can also look in your program. There's some notes that you can use to follow along with us. And as well online, if you're watching us, go ahead and download those notes and find your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, just put your hand up and we will give you a Bible that you can take home with you today and you can have that with you. I also uh, want to encourage you, if you, if, uh, if you uh, don't have a Bible, you can look on your little uh, cellular device. All right, Everybody's got one of those with them today. All right, so you can grab that and you can download your Bible on there. Whatever you have to do to be in the Word of God today with me, that's all I'm asking. All right, and then grab those notes to go on. If you can't find the book of Psalms, just take your Bible and do this. All right, if you see the book of Job, just go right a little bit farther and you'll see it. It'll be right there. It's a big old book. You can find it just by flipping over the middle of your Bible. All right, let's get into it. Get your Bibles, get your notes, turn with me to Psalm chapter 2, and we're going to jump into it together this morning. So I want you to understand first, when you look at Psalm chapter 2, that the author breaks this psalm down into kind of four segments. It starts off with talking to man, right? Talking about man, mankind. And then it talks about who God is, where God sits. Then it talks about who the future Jesus is going to be. And then it comes back around to man at the end and says, now that you know where you sit, who God is, and what he wants to do, now you've got to make a decision. Right? And that's how he ends Psalm chapter 2. And we're going to look at the entire psalm together this morning. But I want you to see that pattern and how the author wrote this out. So let's look again at Psalm chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Why are the nations so angry? Why do they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepare for battle. The rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed one, who is Jesus Christ. Verse 3, let us break their chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. You know, the first thing that we see here in Psalm chapter 2 is that mankind is incredibly blinded 
by pride. So blinded by pride. Their pride is driving them in a completely different direction than where God, where God wants them to be. You know, and, and it's funny to see how pride just affects everybody. everybody especially men, right? Guys in the house, ah, uh, yeah, we, ha- we struggle with this a little bit more than I think the ladies do, all right? Uh, even this week, man, as I was preparing this message, I'm writing this and I'm studying this, I had, like, serious writer's block. I couldn't, I stared at this passage, you know, for, like, two or three days. Usually by, you know, I already know what I'm going to preach, you know, for six months out. So I'm like, oh, Psalm chapter two. So Monday I get and I'm sitting there and I read it and I'm looking at it and studying it. All right, I mean, it's there. Tuesday, still reading it, still studying it, nothing. Wednesday, still reading it, still studying it. I'm like, what in the world? I gotta have this thing to Linda by Thursday morning. I'm gonna get fired. Like, I don't know what to do. I'm, I just, I cannot, I'm just, and then all of a sudden it hits me, right? And I just had to stop and just pray and understand. Mike, you got some issues you gotta deal with first, man. Like, how are you going to go and present if you're not willing to be before God yourself. So I had to deal with that myself. And then all of a sudden, man, it was like, there it is. I mean, God was just right there the whole time. And that pride in our lives blinds us, so blinds us from what God wants to do in our lives, what he wants not only to do in us, but through us. That pride can stop us from helping others around us but we just let it dictate who we are and where we're going, what we're doing. And it stops us blind right where we are. Mankind is so blinded by pride. Proverbs 16 says that pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. You know, when you're blinded by that pride, we can't even see sense. Look at this, what they're saying. Why are the nations so angry? Why are, why are they wasting their time with futile plans? You know, they're preparing to go to battle. They're they're plotting against the Lord and against Jesus. I mean, they don't even see this. Like, who's going to, in their right mind, say, I'm bigger, better, and stronger than God? I mean, they obviously, right, think he's there. I mean, the, 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 the Hebrew nation was legendary, especially under the rule of David. I mean, nobody messed with David and his army and the blessings that God was doing through the nation of Israel at that time. And they're going to sit there and say, we're going to go up against God. You know, we just, sometimes we just, we we can't even see straight. We don't make any sense. We live and make these decisions that that just don't have any, you know, real, they just don't make sense at all. In fact, I look at the Bible often, I'll sit there and say, listen guys, it's not that complicated. Most of the Bible is just common sense. Most of it. It's like, you want to know what not to do? Well, don't kill anybody. Did you need that written down? Right? Like, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Not, you know, I guess maybe some of us might need that a little bit. You know, there's, there's, you know, don't cheat on your spouse. Okay. Duh. Right? Treat other people the way that you want to be treated. Right? We, we struggle with all these different things and we complicate them and we make them so hard. Like, oh, we don't know what to do. Yes, you do. I mean, even at, the, at your birth, when God created mankind, when he created you, he gave you the, the indication inside of your body, inside of your mind, inside of your heart to tell you, look, that is not a good idea. It's not a good idea. We make it so complicated. And most of the Bible, just common sense. Doing good. Being kind, loving. And we, we just, we, we, we're like, oh no, that's just too hard to understand. And, and you know why? Because we're blinded. We're blinded by the pride. We're, you know, I can't love that person because I'm more important. I can't help that person because I need to be helped. I can't give that person something because I need it. You know, I can't give God any time because I need that time. We're blinded by our selfishness and by our pride, and we're missing out on what it is that God has for us. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. I want you to 
Look at that verse one more time. It says, the, he has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They don't believe in God. It doesn't say that he's blinded the minds of those that believe in him. It just says that those in the, that don't believe in God. So anyone that's not following God, is, remember we talked about this last week, right? Every decision you make, every choice, right? You're either taking one step closer to God or one step closer to Satan. Because there's only two directions to go. You're either following God or you're following Satan. You don't even necessarily need to believe in him to be making that choice. And he's saying that those that are not following God, not believing in God, they're blinded by Satan, who is the prince, the king of this world right now. A lot of people don't know that or like to admit that. Yes, God is the creator of the universe. Yes, Jesus is the savior of our world. But you know who owns the deed to this world right now? It's Satan. Until Jesus Christ returns, Satan has the deed to this world. He is the king. He prowls on it. He walks around it. He completely screws up our lives. And he says that those that don't believe in God, they're completely blinded. They don't see it. They don't have that sense. Not only do we can't see sense, but we can't see truth. Look at verse 3. It says, let us break the chains, they cry, and free ourselves from slavery to God. Listen, friends, God, that is not our God. God is not bounding you with chains. God is not putting you under persecution. God wants to free you, wants to give you hope, wants to give you life, wants to give you purpose. And they don't see this. They're blinded to the truth. They can't see that truth. John 8 says, For you are the children, for you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do evil things that he does. He, is a, he, is a, he was a murderer from the beginning. He's always hated the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. You know, it's, it's just like that little brother, right, that follows around the older sibling. You know, the, the older boy, he's got his hat on backwards. So the little boy, he's got his hat on backwards, right? Little, the, the older brother, he wears those, you know, cool jeans. The little, little brother, he's got those cool jeans. Or a dad, you know, you ever see the kid following around his dad? wants to be just like dad when you're following the devil we mimic what he does we mimic how he lives what he wants us to do it says it literally says for the children of your father the devil it's a harsh reality something that you don't want to read or to think about or to understand but the reality is that we emulate who we follow. We emulate who we follow. You follow God? Live in righteousness. He goes, if you want to follow God, then show me. Show me that you're following God. But if you're not following Him, then who are you emulating? Who are you emulating? You know, there's this guy, uh, David Pasternak. He plays for the Boston Bruins. He's, uh, if you ever watch hockey, all right, every time they're doing warm, the Bruins are doing warm-ups, it's called the pasta show, right? Because what he does is he walks around and he'll go behind his players and the other team's players and he'll start, like, mimicking their warm-ups. So he'll be standing, they don't even know it, they'll be you know, warming up and he's, like, uh, warming up and he's dancing behind and he's mimicking what these people are doing, right? They don't even know it. They don't even see it. They don't even understand it. But all of a sudden, there's this two people doing the exact same thing. You know, I want, I want you to think real quick about who you're following. Who are you emulating? Who are you mimicking? What's the life? What does your life say that you're following? You know, if I looked at your life, if I, if I asked the three closest people around you and I said, hey, you know, how's Chip living? What kind of person is he? What would they say? What answer would they have? Who are you emulating? Who do people see when they look at you? See, mankind is blinded by their pride. But let's look at God. Starting in verse 4, it says that God is not shaken by chaos. Look at verse 4. It says, but the one, I want you to circle that, the one, the one who rules. There isn't two, there isn't three, there isn't four. There is one ruler, one creator. 
But the one who rules in heaven, he laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then in anger, he rebukes them, terrifying them with his fierce fury. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on my holy mountain. Friends, God is not shaken by the chaos in our world or the chaos in your life. God sees everything. He's there through it all. He understands it. The pains, the wars, the hate, all of it that's happening around us. God is not scared or put back by it. In fact, it says that he, in fact, laughs at it. He laughs at our vain efforts to go against him. That's not the verse that you kind of like, you know, you're going to teach your Sunday school kids, right? He laughs at those who mock him. It's not really Sunday school material, but it's true. He sits up in heaven and he looks down and we have all these, you know, we're so prideful and we're trying to go against God so hard. We think we know what's right. And he sits there and he doesn't laugh at it in, you know, like, uh, you know, evil doctor strange type of situation. He's, he's, he's sitting there. He's saying, listen, you can't do, you can't win. You can't beat me. You're not bigger. You're not stronger. I'm still in control. You think you know, but you don't. He laughs at our vain efforts. Galatians 6 says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Always harvest what you plant. You know, there are many things that happen in our lives that we don't understand. There's a lot of things that come down our road that we just don't get. That we question and we look at it like, God, why? Why would this happen? But there's a lot of things in our lives that happen because we made it happen. And we can't forget that. Too often we like to just use the excuse. Like we just we just like to sit there and say, well, I have no idea why that would happen to me. I have no idea why all of a sudden this is going down. And and, and as we 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 love to live in the grace of God, don't we? Man, even if you're not a believer, you like to call the grace of God out, right? Oh, God is so good. He's going to take care of me. It's true. God is good. God is love. But God is just. And we can't sit there and turn around and get mad at God when we live within the exact place we put ourselves. Our sin. Our situation. Our problem. It's amazing how we like to turn that table. And sit there and say, you know what? You know, uh, God is so good, he's going to take care of all these things. And then we question why, 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 why. But the reality is that we put ourselves where we stand. We've got to be careful. You've got to be really careful between blaming God or, or not putting any blame on yourself. We reap what we harvest. All right? What you, where you put yourselves, it says, just don't be misled. All right, we can't mock the justice of God. He will all, you will always, 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 always harvest what you plant. And don't forget that. Let it be, he also rebukes all sin and rebellion. He rebukes it all. Verse 5, it says, Then in anger he rebukes and terrifying them with his fierce fury. He rebukes sin and rebellion. It says in Revelations 3.19, it says, I correct and I discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. I discipline everyone I love. Man, nobody likes to be disciplined. Nobody likes that. Nobody enjoys being course corrected. But he says, I love you. And because I love you, I'm going to do this. Because I want you on the right track, I'm going to allow this to happen to you. I'm going to be directly involved with this discipline. Sometimes I just get so scared that we live so much in the grace that we forget and we make excuses for our own decisions. You know, I had a moment even just yesterday where someone was saying, you know, listen, we, we, 
we, we live, in, you know, we're all sinners. We all make mistakes. You know, we're all sinners. It just happens. It just happens. And the response given to that person was, yes, we're forgiven, but that doesn't give us an excuse to sin or to keep sinning. I tell my kids all the time, sorry means you're going to try really hard not to do it again. Right? That's what sorry means. It doesn't just mean that you're upset that you hurt somebody. It means that I'm going to try really, really hard not to do it again. And yet we keep coming around. But he will rebuke sin and rebellion. He will, and he disciplines those that he loves. Page 2, you know, he also has already won the victory. Look at verse 6. For the Lord declares, I have placed my chosen king on the throne in Jerusalem on, circle this, my holy mountain. There's that creator. He owns it all. He's there. He has it. The future. Listen, I already read the whole story. I read the end of this book. All right? I know who wins. All right? I know what's going to end up happening. The story is already won. The victory is already there. And yet we still continue to think, just like who? The devil, Satan, that he has a chance. That's why he's still fighting tooth and nail all the time. I mean, even after Satan, if you read the book of Revelations, you read the book of Isaiah, the book of David, you understand, or Daniel, I mean, you understand that, that even after Satan is is thrown away and chained for a thousand years. He still comes back at the end for one more try to win it all. He doesn't give up. He continues to go against the grain of God and who emulates him, right? So many people emulate that attitude. I'm going to go against God. I'm going to go against what he wants. I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to do my own thing. I don't care how many times I've heard it. I don't care how many times somebody said it to me. I'm going to do my thing. That's what we continue to do. But friend, the battle is already won. Philippians 1.6 says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The battle is already won. Victory is already there. So how do we live within that? How do we find that victory? What do we do? How do we get there? Then we go into this next section which talks about who Jesus is. So Jesus is that victory that we just talked about. Look at verse 7. It says, The king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Now it's funny because when David was writing this, He's writing this from the throne that God put him on, right? And he's saying that, that I, am a son of, I am the son of God. I am a child of God. And he's writing, because I'm a child of God, that God's going to take care of me. He doesn't even realize that he's writing prophecy in this moment. Doesn't even see it. But through the Holy Spirit, he is writing down this. He's talking about himself, but he's actually writing about Jesus. The king proclaims the Lord's decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Or some versions might say, I have revealed myself as your father. And he's going on and he says, he says, only ask and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the whole earth as your possession. You will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. John 3, 16, this is how Jesus won it all right here. Jesus is the victory, how? For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the, the, the killing stroke right there with the sword. That's how it all came back around. When we're living in our pride, when, we're, when the world is against God, when we're emulating Satan, how is it that God's going to win? Well, he sent his son to die on a cross, to defeat sin, the sin that's pulling us away from God. He says Jesus is that victory. How? Be, through his death. How do we know that Jesus is the victory? Well, it tells us a couple different things here about how amazing Jesus is here. The first one is we see that Jesus is the Son of 
God. He is the Son of God. The king proclaims that the Lord said to me, you are my son. In fact, in Matthew 3.17, when Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist, says, a voice from heaven came and said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Who brings me great joy. We know that, that he is the son of God. Well, what does that come with? That comes with a, a lot. To be the son of God? The creator of the world? He is everything. He has it all. He is perfect. He is the Son of God. And He is going to outlast and, and be, you know, it's, it's amazing how rulers and kings and even ourselves, we sit there and we continue to think that we have it all figured out. That we're the ones that everyone's going to remember. That what I do is going to be so important. The world will, will, will write songs about it. In fact, there was a Roman emperor about 300 AD. His name was Diocletian. I said it wrong. I don't know what it really is. Dio something, all right? And his, his legacy, what he wanted people to know him for, to re be remembered by, was to rid the world of Christianity. He burned more Bibles, more scripture, than any other Roman emperor. In fact, he literally built a statue where he thought the last Bible had been destroyed. Like, that was his, he's like, I want to be known as the one that destroyed Christianity. Friends, I want to ask you, how many of you know or remember the Roman emperor Dio something? Nobody. But Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. There has never been anyone more written about, more talked about, more researched, where people have tried to understand who is this Jesus. There is more historical evidence that Jesus was here walking on earth, doing the things he claimed to do, than any other person. We have more evidence about Jesus than we do about Dio something. Even with man going against him, a Roman emperor going against him, nothing could stop the Son of God and his legacy and what he wanted. So we know that he is the Son of God, according to Psalm 2.7. We also know that he is the future ruler of earth. This is only ask and I will give it to you. The nations as your inheritance. The whole earth as your possession. He will be the future ruler of the earth. I talked to you guys a minute ago about right now who owns the earth. It's Satan. A lot of people kind of look at me and are like, what are you talking about? I thought God had it. So this is how, this is how it all goes down, right? God creates the world. God is the owner of the world as he creates it, right? He creates Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, he puts them in the garden. He says, Adam and Eve, this is yours for you to take care of, for you to care for. I'm giving this to you. So now Adam and Eve have the deed to the earth. And then all of a sudden this, you know, slimy little snake comes up and just ruins it all, right? And sin enters the world. And as soon as sin enters the world, do you know who took that deed from Adam and Eve? Satan did. In fact, this whole thing is talked about in the book of Jeremiah. How even the land, how land was given and taken between families and, and, and people. It was literally, there was two deeds made up back then. When you bought land from somebody, you got one deed, which was given to the new owner, and you got another deed that the original owner kept. And that original deed says that if these things happen, there's a clause, if these things happen, then they can then take the land back. There's these stipulations. Right? You look at the book of Revelation. Right? It says that people are, these angels are crying and crying and crying when this scroll is revealed. The scroll is the original owner's scroll. And they're, saying they're crying. And, and John, he goes, he goes, why are they all so upset? And the angel says, because they don't think anybody can fulfill the requirements to get that earth back, to get that deed back. They don't think anybody can do it because the price is so, is so high. And then all of a sudden, this lamb steps forward. You know who the lamb is? Jesus Christ. And he says, I've already paid that price. And now, that, that, those, those regulations, those stipulations, they've been fulfilled. So when Jesus Christ returns, then he will take that deed back from Satan, and he will rule for that thousand years, and then forever after. That's how the whole thing worked. 
And that's why Satan has that deed right now. That's why he has it. But he doesn't hold it forever. In the end, Jesus will be the future ruler of the earth. This is Revelation 11.15. And the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there was a loud voice shouting in heaven, The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. He will reign forever and ever. I wonder who doesn't want to be a part of that kingdom? Who wouldn't want to be ruled by the perfect king, the perfect ruler, to give us peace, to give us hope, to give us everything that we need? So he is the son of God. He is the ruler of future earth. And then he has the power beyond our understanding. Psalm 147, 5 says, How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. His power is beyond anything that we can understand. It says that in verse 9, He will break them with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. He has everything under control. He has it all right there. My question would be, who or what else would you want backing you? What is it that you think is going to get you through the next day or get you through the future to come? Money, a job, relationships, status? Like are all those things what you're going after, what you're yearning for, what you want so bad? Or do you want the all-powerful Son of God backing you? There's a great painting out there. I have no idea what the name of it is. But it's of this little boy, and he's walking down the hallway at school, and you can see his fear of all these bullies that are around him. And all of a sudden, right behind him, you see Jesus. Right behind him, backing him. And now he's just walking with confidence, understanding that the one who's backing him is bigger than any fear he may have. Anything that he might think will keep him down. He knows that Jesus is so much bigger than that. And because of that understanding, now the way that he walks, how he lives, is completely determined by how he sees his God. Friend, how do you see your God? How do you view God? Do you look at him just as someone that's sitting on a mantle? A picture, a cross, a dusty book? Someone that you only meet when you come to church on a Sunday? Is that your God? Or do you truly walk knowing that he's behind you, that he's with you, that he loves you, that he's going to take care of you? So David, he talks about mankind, and he talks about how great God is, and then he talks about who the future hope of Jesus is, and then he comes down at the very last part, those last three verses those last three verses, and he talks about man again. Look at this. In verse 10, he says, now, then. Now. You should circle that word. Now. Right? Because now, number four on the back page of your notes, now we must decide. See, God wants you to choose. So he says, now then, verse 10, you, you kings, now that you understand, now that you've seen, now that I've told you, what does he say to do? He says, act wisely. He goes, act wisely. He says, be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with, re- with reverent fear and rejoice with trembling. Submit to God's royal son, or he will become angry. And you will be destroyed in the midst of your activities. For his anger flares up, against, uh, flares up in an instant. But what joy for all those who take refuge in him. See, he wants us to decide. Now you must decide first john 1 6 and 7 says so we are lying if we say that we have fellowship with god but go on living in spiritual darkness so he's saying that hey you sit there and say you're all set you've got it figured out i'm a christian i go to church i'm i'm i've got this thing you know this i've got the jesus thing but then you go on living what in spiritual darkness he says, we are not practicing the truth. 
But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So you get to make that choice. You get to decide how you live your life. You 100% get that choice. And if you don't want to follow God, that's 100% your choice. But just understand, the only other direction to go is towards Satan. If God is not your leader, then Satan is, even if you don't realize it. Even if you don't understand that. This is not encouraging, Pastor Mike. It's true. It's not. It's hard. Nobody likes to sit there and say, oh, you know, I don't believe in God, but I'm all about Satan. A lot of people aren't saying that. They're just saying, I'm not about God. But the reality is, that is the only other route. But you have to make that decision, and God's not going to force you. He tells those that, that sit there and say that they love God or understand what's happening. He says, now then, right, here's your choice. Here's your opportunity. He says, act in wisdom. Act in wisdom. What is wisdom? Remember, we talked about wisdom a couple times, right? You got knowledge, knowing something. And then you got wisdom, the application of knowledge, right? So, like, you take the good old tomato, right? We talked about the tomato. Wisdom is known, or knowledge is knowing that, that uh, a tomato is what? A fruit. Wisdom is knowing don't put it in the fruit salad, right? And then philosophy is figuring out that a tomato, that ketchup is a tomato smoothie. You know, like, we all sit there and try and figure out what this tomato thing is. The knowledge, the wisdom, right? But he says, I want you to act in wisdom. Now you have the knowledge. He goes, I told you, now then, act wisely. Take what I've taught you and walk in it. Make a choice. It's all on you at that point. So he says, act with wisdom. Ephesians 5. Right? So he says, so be careful how you live. He says, don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Are you seeking God and his understanding? Are you seeking God and the truth that he has for you in your life? Are you seeking him out? Do you want to walk with God, to be with God, to do what it is that he's called you to do. We have to decide where we're going to go. You've got to act with wisdom if you're going to say that you follow God. Letter B says that you should get up and serve. Verse 11, serve the Lord with reverent fear and rejoicing with trembling. Right? Rejoicing with trembling. How many of you like that? What does that even mean? Is that like you're like joyously scared? You know? What does that even mean? No, it means that you are so overly excited about who God is and what he's doing in your life that you're shaken. You just, you can't even get rid of it. Right? You like went all Pentecostal on us, right? You're just, ah! Right? You're just so excited about who he is. Right? I love my favorite verse, my life verse, James 2.19. Right? says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. He says, you believe that there's one God, pat yourself on the back. That's awesome, you believe that there's one God. He goes, but guess what? The demons believe that there's one God, and they tremble. It's the only verse I found where the demons actually beat out the believers in God. He's saying that the demons' belief in God is so strong that it actually moves them because they shake at the thought of God. They shake at the thought of God. We think about God, and half the time it doesn't even get us off the couch. But the demons, they believe so heavily in him that it actually shakes them. And he says that you should rejoice with trembling. You should be so excited about who God is that you can't even sit still. You're like that five-year-old at a candy store, right? Mom's trying to reel you in, right? Or no, better yet, the grocery store, right? Ooh, what's that? Ooh, what's that? Ooh, what's that? Right? And you're just so excited about who God is that you just can't even stand still. You should be rejoicing in who he is and the opportunities to serve. Listen, don't let your gifts go to waste. Never settle, friends. Never settle. 
always, always, always fight more for God with your gifts, with your talents, with your experiences, your trials. Always go after more of God. Don't ever settle. Once you settle, you're going to start to become miserable. Trust me, I've been there. He dragged me so far down. He beat me over the head so hard because I settled. Don't settle. Don't ever settle. You keep going, learning, serving, wanting. Act in wisdom. Get up and serve and then choose today who you will follow. It says in verse 12, submit to God's royal son or he will become angry. Choose today who you will follow. Joshua 24 says, but if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today who you will serve. Again, he's not saying you have to do it. He's saying make your choice. Decide what you want to do. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be times where it's not even going to be fun. It's going to be hard, awkward, uncomfortable. Oh, you're going to feel that pressure point, right? Like, ah, I got to make that change in my life. I got to do that differently. I can't hang out with that person. I got to stop saying those words. Oh, it's going to hurt. But what are you going to do? Choose today who you will follow. Number five. This whole message was about who is your leader. So I want you to look at your life right now. Think about it like, you know, from 30 minutes ago when you walked in here, right? Who were you following? Who was in front of you then? You can look at your life and figure that answer out. I don't know if you can look at your life and you can answer that. Who was in front of you before you came here today? Who were you following? If it wasn't God, only one other person. So who was in front of you? Take time now to answer that. Make sure you understand that. Figure that out. If you don't sit there and answer that question right now, you've completely wasted your morning. Completely wasted it. If you're not willing to answer that question, honestly, I didn't put a blank on it this week because I didn't want you to, you know, anybody to feel real conscious about that. I want you to think about it, though. Who are you following? Take time to answer that. First Peter 2, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. What a great verse. Who wants to be free? I do. Who wouldn't want to be free? Who wouldn't want to have that? Who wouldn't want to live with peace and hope and love? It's so easy to live free. I have very few worries in this world. Very few. Obviously, as a dad, I fear for my children. As a husband, I pray nothing ever happens to my wife. You know, and those are kind of earthly feelings that I have, right? But the reality is, even if something did happen to my kids, even if something did happen to my wife, I know exactly where they're going to be. I lost a baby. I know exactly where he is. I don't walk around in sorrow and grief. Why? Because my hope is in something that's so much bitter, bigger. I, I know who won. I know who has victory. And because he has victory, I then have victory. There is nothing that Satan can do to me that is going to drop me down and keep me down. There might be some things that put me to my knees and are going to hurt. I've had a couple of those moments in my life. But I'm standing back up. Why? Because he is good. He is love. He is my comfort. He is my hope. I want you to make the decision to change and serve today. 
change and serve today. Don't waste any more days. We have no idea how many days we have. All of our days are numbered, though. No idea how many. Do you want to waste another one? Or do you want to live in hope? Do you want to continue to live in grief? Or do you want to find real joy and peace? It's your choice. I promise you, it's awesome. It's awesome. I would love, love for you to join me on that journey. Your future can be held in your hands or in God's hands. Who will you follow today? God, we come before you. Just closing out this part together, this time, right now, this moment. And God, I ask that you would reach into our hearts and our minds and convict us, Lord. God, change us. I dare say, God, beat us to our knees. God, we just, we desire so many things. And oftentimes we're missing out on the provider of it. So Lord, I ask right now that your spirit would fill us. God, that you would come upon us right now. And God, that you would show us, reveal to each and every one of us, individually, where we sit, where our hope and our joy and our peace can be found only in you. Friend, if you're sitting there today and you want real hope, you want real peace, you're sitting in a moment of grief in your life, reach out to Jesus. Ask Him for forgiveness. Ask Him to become the leader of your life. Thank Him for dying on the cross for your sins, for your choices, defeating death, rising from the grave because he loves you so much and he wants to be in a relationship with you. God, move in our hearts right now. Change who we are when we got here. Make us new as we leave. God, go before us. Friend, call on the name of of Jesus. Christian, if you're sitting there, you're off track, you're not where you, you know you're supposed to be, get back on track. If you're settling right now, stop settling. Go before God. Ask Him to search your heart for the hidden sins in your life. And then get it right. Ask for forgiveness. Change your your destination. Everybody sitting here today, watching, can be in a place of peace with Jesus if you want to be. Friend, who is your leader? Who are you following? What are you wanting in life that God cannot give you? Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you. We ask it all in your son's name. Amen.